All right, guys. We're starting up. We have a little bit of issue with sound, but this is being recorded. It's just not being transmitted out to you all. So I'm just going to try to speak loud enough. And in case you don't hear me, just do that. OK? Thank you. Um, I just returned from Nepal two days ago, uh, where we were running our first ever program with Engineering World Health. We had 14 engineers in six hospitals there. And uh, we found four additional hospitals to put engineers into that needed engineering aid. That's the main scope of our work. Do I need to speak louder? All right. Good I have three bottles of water here. We took this uh, image during a Himalayan flight, and actually all the images in this presentation are taken by during our projects, just so you know. Here's another image of me standing in Nepal, just for introductions. This was what we used for promo last time, which I thought was funny because I was born in a pink room, actually. Um, but other than that, let's move on to the more interesting thing. Engineering World Health and the Technical University of Denmark has entered a collaboration, which today has turned into what you see over here, the Engineering World Health chapter at DTU. This is the chapter that has started our program in Nepal. We've had one student in Rwanda before. We've had five students in Tanzania. That was in 2014. And then in 2015, we had five additional people. Wow, now I'm talking way too loud. Five additional people in Tanzania. What do we do? Mainly, we've repaired medical equipment. That's the number one scope of engineering world health. That's what it's famous for. And then we educate about the correct use of it. And then we also try to make needs assessment, do a form of engineering clinical research that we afterwards use to develop ideas, conceive ideas for projects. And there's our logo in color. So just a little bit about, and now I lost sound again, okay. Just a little bit about our organization here at the Technical University of Denmark. We have a board consisting of six people currently. We elect that every year at a general assembly. And we have four sub-branches of our organization. And this is where our students can engage themselves. So if anyone is seeing this thinking that they want to be a part of it, you could be a part of either our educational group, either the group that sends people abroad, our projects group, or our PR group. Among others, arranging projects like this one. We have a range of partners, as you can see here. Um, some of them are helping us fund our projects abroad, sending our students abroad, um, donating in various ways. Uh, one interesting thing that is quite new right now, if you look in the middle, is the Nordic 5 Tech collaboration. It's a collaboration where we allow our students or students from the Nordic 5 Tech schools, this is an alliance among technical schools in the Nordic countries, in Scandinavia, all of those people can come participate in a course here at DTU and the afterwards being program in Nepal. So I'll touch more on that later, but first I just want to talk about the fundamental problematic that EWH addresses. And that is that as much as 70% of essential medical equipment is not functioning in the developing world, quote Ban Ki-moon, United Nations, he said this in 2005, and the main issues leading to it is that there's no local production in these countries, so we cannot get spare parts when something is donated. There's lack of education. People don't really know how to repair the things, at least not in the resource-poor hospitals. And then there's a lack of general resources. There just isn't any money. So there are a range of publications showing various statistics about the major problem of medical equipment in the developing world not working. And it's really interesting. I encourage you to look into it. It's not what we are going to talk about today. Today we'll talk a little bit about, about engineering, the work in the field that we do. I'll talk to you a little bit about the work I did when I was in Tanzania. Um, and then we'll talk about 
the world and health as well. So I'll be touching generally on some world public health issues. So first let's talk about engineering. <clears throat> in 2014, in the summer, I traveled for the first time with Engineering World Health to Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center and Mwenzi Regional Hospital. We wrote a report about our work, which you can see on the left side, and on the other side there is another report describing the work of Engineering World Health that year. This is an infant incubator that we worked on that I'll be talking a little bit more about. So this is just to illustrate what type of things our students can do when they are abroad. Now this was one of our first fixes. It's the most basic piece of medical equipment and a main symbol for medical doctors showing who they are. They always go around with it at the hospitals, right? Now this one wasn't working because a screw was missing. And that's the screw we've inserted right here. And really it's a super simple fix. If the screw is not in there, the thing is just turning around. And the reason I, I just think the image is symbolic and cool, um, that's why I'm using it. Uh, and the really funny story about it was that this screw has to be of the perfect size to fit in there. So we ran around town in Moshi and we found a so-called fundi wasa. And the fundi wasa is a time technician translated directly from Swahili. And this guy had screws from watches in small matchboxes. We looked through eight of these matchboxes until we found one screw which was the exact fit. So this is quite often that we work like this when we are abroad. Really, Engineering World Health is all about trying to find innovative or creative solutions to the problems we have. And many of them turn out to be quite simple. That's what's, in a sense, innovative about it. Here's an infant incubator that had some issues. As you can see, we are testing it here. And to test it, we've covered up the entrance holes, these sleeve holes, to see if anything is wrong with it. The funny thing was that the department there, the biomedical engineering department, had come up with theories about what was wrong. And they were showing us this figure that you look, if you open it, the temperature drops, and then it's going to overheat and the temperature is going to raise. And that sets off the alarm, so you just need to have some sensor issue, or you probably have some sensor issue in this one. Um, it turns out that it's not a sensor issue. If you noticed on the picture before, there were no sleeves on it, which means that the cool air is going in right on the sensor, and the sensor is measuring a cool air, which makes the whole thing heat a lot, then it overheats, and then it sets off the alarm, and you can't really use it. So really, the only problem of it was, once again, that we didn't have the correct sleeves, and then it had small mechanical issues, like these latches weren't really working, or it was locked with tape. So it was all just general maintenance, but it was really interesting to see what theories they had made about it. Here's another one that I really love. GE had donated, very generously, a perfectly new infant warmer, or infant resuscitation unit, um, to this hospital. And I love this picture on the right side where you can see how they have small beds or small, I don't know, container places where the babies can lie in them. And that's where they put the bed. And there's one behind it and there's one here, but there's no baby here. And why not? Because the thing is standing in four square meter room that's heated up so much by this machine that it's like a sauna to be in there. And we were wondering why. Why are they using this super great piece of equipment like this. If you'll notice, I don't know if any one of you know this piece of equipment, but if you notice this little thing here, that's a simple skin temperature sensor. And you'll notice that it goes down here below the bed. So you're actually measuring the temperature below the bed, which is not going to reach the infant skin temperature. The machine is just going to overheat and then you can't put the baby in there, right? You have to put the baby around the thing because it's going to heat too much. It's a quite simple issue, but if you don't have time to read a 100-page manual or just understand that nowadays these work with skin temperature sensors and not manually, then you're not going to be using it properly. So we call it education and teaching, but really it's also just informing and explaining people how these things work. Uh, this is actually my favorite example because it always also includes some other funny, interesting things. Right here it says Abgar. Do any of you know the Abgar score, maybe? In any case, I'll tell you. Abgar uh, is a score which is invented to assess the health of a newborn baby. So it's actually an acronym named after Virginia Abgar. It stands for appearance, so you look at the color of the baby. It stands for pulse, 
stands for grimace. So response to stimuli, does the baby respond when you stimulate it somehow? It stands for activity, and it stands for respiration. And you try to assess these parameters as a doctor to t tell something on a scale from zero to 10, how well is the baby? And they were asking me, how does the machine measure the APGAR score? Because they thought GE had developed this wonderful new piece of equipment that could also measure that for you. Now, you're engineers, many of you, so you might know just as well as me that with, if, unless you have some very advanced image recognition, you can't really do that. Um, and this is actually just a stopwatch. So it helps you measure the APGAR score, and it sets off an alarm after three minutes when you have to do it again. That's basically what it does. And then there's also an x-ray tray on it. That was the last one. How do you do x-ray with this one? Well, you can't, but you can put the tray, the x-ray detector into it, and then bring an x-ray unit and take an x-ray. Um, so these are some of my favorite fixes that we did in Tanzania that year. Here's another one, suction pumps, a very classic thing that always has problems because they become so dirty and they're never sterile. They're meant to be sterile, but they never really are. And the reason you can see on this exploded view is that little thing there, that's the filter. And that's really fine filter, it's a bacterial filter we call it, so even the bacteria cannot pass. So it's designed to keep a sterile environment in a surgical unit. But if you don't change them, then it's not sterile at all. And usually they actually don't. They actually leave them dirty until they're clogged and then the suction pump is not working anymore. And then they're not using the entire machine just because of that. So what you can do is just change those with gauze and it's still a lot cleaner than what you did before. By the way, those are $15 a piece, that little white thing. Here's a genius thing. Um, one of the very, very common issues in the developing world is constant power cuts. Maybe some of you have experienced it yourselves or you've just heard of it. It happens all the time. So what you do with this one is that you make a manual suction with your foot and then you use that to suck. It's really what you would think they need in the developing world where these things are not working and it's really, really smart except that no one knows how to use it it sounds very, very simple. You just push the pedal and then you're sucking and sucking and sucking. But really, it's not that simple. Now, because of that, we made a small quick start guide for that. We thought we'll teach this department how to use this thing. And the whole key is that you can't just stand there next to a patient and push the pedal because you can't really keep your arm still and you can't create enough vacuum. So before you use it, and this is the key up there, you have to break it twice and then you create your vacuum with the pump. And you can create a lot of vacuum. This one goes all the way up to 0.08 bars, which is enough vacuum to suck almost 0.75 liters. So it can do a lot of vacuum. You just have to do it in the right way. Um, no one really knew this, so we made this quick start guide, and it's really designed to be taught in just five minutes. And after the five minutes, they just get these images, we print them, we put them on the machine, and they can use them like this to kind of remember how it's used. Okay, so you also have to put water around the rim like it shows. And once they've learned it, actually we went back a year later, there are still some nurses who remembered how to use this one. So in that sense, it could really have an impact that we were there just to find out how this piece of equipment is working. They're really full. They're full of patients. They don't necessarily have the time to figure these things out. There we are teaching how to use it. <coughs> now there's one final fix that I was very proud of. Uh, you can see that I was proud of it because I'm standing like this. And you can see that there's an additional vaporizer. These vaporizers are what vaporizes the medicine so we can breathe it down into our lungs and it puts us to sleep during surgery. So this is an anesthesia machine. Um, and this is the anesthesiologist at the department. Now, it was a truly simple fix. It really had a stuck screw that wasn't in there so the thing didn't turn and because of that it didn't work. So we changed that screw and it was working. But that's not really why we're proud of it. The reason we're proud of it is that this is the anesthesia machine they use during laparoscopic surgeries. And just a month later, we found this article, my group found this article, the KCMC scoops a top international award from the British Medical Journal for having provided laparoscopic surgery, keyhole surgery, in 
a developing real resource setting. So we were proud of that one. It's a good, it's my favorite one. Interesting thing, I was standing next to the surgeon while he was operating and the camera stopped working and he didn't have a substitute unit to exchange it with or a biomedical engineer who could fix it for him. So he had to shift to open surgery even though he knew exactly how to do these surgeries. So this is just a little bit about our work and it's really what engineering world health does. This should illustrate how students can go, students who understand these equipments, the fundamental principle behind these equipments, can go and actually repair many of these things and teach people how to use them. Um, and it's a great experience for many of those students. It really is something that can, uh, you can use your knowledge in biomedical engineering in a different way and in a very impactful way. Now, I wanna move on to something else in this talk um, because this is the very micro level that we've been viewing at. And I also have a very large interest in international development in general. And I have a couple of views on the world and world health that I think are really interesting and that I really wanna talk about today at the library for you, um, about how it's going in the world. And my absolute favorite quote uh, in the Danish media over the past years is this one. I don't know if any one of you have heard it before, um, but it's definitely uh, my favorite quote, and I am going to show you the video. You may have guessed by now who it is. It's this guy, Professor of Global Health, Hans Rosling. Let's spend a little bit of time with him because he does some amazing things, and he really does some things that, that teaches you to appreciate big data as well in a whole different way from a, from a place of global health. Um, so let me just show you this video here. <laughs> Man måste ju ha en grundläggande skolutbildning. Och sen måste man följa upp de här grundläggande fakta. Jag tror att större delen av världens befolkning är jättefaktiga. Flickorna går inte i skolan, barnen vaccineras inte. Och här är de rika länderna och så försöker de komma dit som flyktingar. Då vet man ju inte hur det är. Man måste förstå att det finns länder på alla nivåer. Och de flesta är någonstans i mitten. De går i skolan, de är vaccinerade och de har tvåbarnsfamiljer. Du pratar om befolkningstillväxt. Mm -hmm. Antal barn på jorden har slutat öka. Antal barn på jorden har slutat öka därför att de allra flesta använder preventivmedel. Och det visste inte Danmarks journalister när jag frågar dem. Men det jag tänker på sett från ett medieperspektiv, inte bara här i programmet men medier generellt, det är ju att att många medier vill säga vi rapporterar om världens tillstånd som den är. Och lige nu är det krig, konflikter, kaos, oro och en hel rad. Nej, 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 nej. Du har ju fel. Rakt upp och ner fel. Det var ett fantastiskt val i Nigeria. Demokratiskt val i Afrikas största nation. Där en halvduglig regering ersattes av en mycket kompetent eh, chef nu. Mohammed den nya som får stöd från hela befolkningen. Det fantastiska valet som var Indonesien förra året. De framsteg som är i Indien. Igår så förklarade vi att Indien nu är fritt från stelkram. Men Nigeria är fanget i en djup terrorkrig mot Boko Haram. Ja, en liten del av Nigeria. Inte resten. Nigeria har en snabb ekonomisk tillväxt och fallande barnadödlighet. Om ni väljer att visa ni ändå, om ni väljer att för mig att bara visa min sko, den är ju jätteful, det är ju bara en del av mig. Om du väljer att visa mitt ansikte så är det en annan. Så, så, ja, jag ska... Ni visar ju en liten del och kallar det för världen. Den stora skillnaden, att flickorna går i skolan, att barnen vaccineras, att de flesta har elektricitet hemma, att människor är kapabla, och är yrkesfolk runt omkring i världen. Det är viktigt att visa. Men det händer så sakta, så det kommer inte med nyheter. Vad baserar du den viden på? Jag använder vanlig statistik som är sammanställd av Världsbanken och FN. Och det är inte kontroversiellt. Det här är ingenting som man kan diskutera. Jag har rätt och du har fel. When he put the shoe on the, on the table, I knew that this was probably my favorite clip all time from Deadline. Um, he is truly a great person and he does something really, really great. And it made me want to shift over to something else in this presentation today because he talks about some global health issues and he's actually right. I'll show you in a second. I 
I've prepared some of the statistics that he uses. Like that. So actually, he created the Gap Mounder Foundation with his son. And that's what we're seeing here. Is This is big data. This is viewing a lot of data at the same time to be able to say something general about the world. Now, we're looking at the x-axis here. That's income per person. How much money are we making? It's really an expression of how rich we are. On the y-axis, we have life expectancy. How do we live, right? So if we have a straight line going up through like that, x equals 1, then... Not x equals... Let's forget about that. Anyway, if you have a straight line there, that means that as we are getting richer, we are also living longer. Our life expectancy increases. But there's something else that I find really, really interesting about this figure. And it is that it goes through time. You can play it and go through time, and you'll see when life expectancies in certain countries drop. And I really love to look at that, because if we just go back and start at the 1900s here, and look at the life expectancy, which is fairly low. In a lot of countries, it's down at 30. You can see in China, it's about 32 and a half, and the income per capita. Then we can look at the development in the last 100 years. Now, I just want to tell you now, and this is the exercise that I'm trying to do, which is not an easy one, but it's the exercise I'm trying to do nonetheless, to tell you the major historical events of the last 100 years in just a minute or so. Now, I'll just let you know, meanwhile, that the colors represent continents. So these are the Americas. This is Central Asia and Russia. Uh, sorry, Russia, Central Asia, and Europe. Um, there we have the Arabic countries, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan African countries are blue, and red is Southeast Asia. And then you have the year in the middle, obviously. And let's just try to play this and see what happens. Can we see some major things? I'm looking for drops in life expectancy. Now, the first one, I can tell you already, is going to be in 1914, right there. Look, there we saw a drop. I'll just play it, whoops. And there we have, this was a global influenza epidemic that happened right there. You set the entire life expectancy in the whole world dropping. Next up, you're going to have, you see, in 1932, a famine. I'm just speeding this up a little bit. If I'm brave, you can't say it fast enough. And you see, we had a famine in Europe and Russia. That, did you see the balls drop? And later on, in 1940, we have the Second World War. Once again, the European bubbles drop, the life expectancy drops. And in 1960, we're going forward a little bit, we're going to have a famine in China. So watch the big red one here, that's China. And we're looking for 1960, okay? And there's the famine. You can see life expectancy drops in the entire country. In the 70s, we have the Pol Pot regime. You'll see a small ball. That's Cambodia that will be dropping the terrible regime in Cambodia. I'm sure you've all heard of it. And later on, in the 80s, we actually, nothing really happens. We're just getting richer. The life expectancy is increasing. You can see that most countries are just happy. Now, in the 1990s that we're going into in just a minute, you have a genocide in Rwanda and an insurgency in Burundi. And that are the two blue balls that just dropped right there. And finally, in 2010, which is coming up in just a second, you're going to see the earthquake in Haiti. And Haiti is right there. I'm clicking it out for you. And there is 2010. Okay? But these are all the worst news of the last 100 years. The general thing, that is what we read about, right? These are the worst news we've had for 100 years. But the general image is that we've grown richer and we are getting, we are living longer. So I just think it's great to keep in mind this fact when we read about all the bad news and we hear about the world that it's actually going really well. Now let's move on to another one that I really, really love and that also explains a lot about why the world is so overpopulated. So I'm talking a little bit about demography here, okay? So let's just look at the last 200 years and let's go through it really, really fast at first. Um, what you see is that in the industrialization at the end of the 1900s, you're going to see how life expectancy is inc oh, sorry, the children per women. I'll just, I'll just stop it for now because now it's getting interesting, okay? On the y-axis, we have how many children that we have. On the x-axis, we have the child mortality. So where do we want to be? We really want to be 
as low on child mortality as we can at all, right? We don't want our children to die, obviously. So we want to be down here and not up here. And this is children per women. How many children are we having? Well, I don't know where we want to be, that depends. But I can just say that when we began in the beginning of the 1800s, we were all the way up here around 500. Okay, that means 500 per thousand. That meant that in a lot of countries, I can just go back and show you, half of all children died. Look at that. This is China, 417 per 1,000. This is just 200 years ago. So it was a really different world, and obviously we needed to have a lot of children to counterweigh that. We needed to have a lot of children to make sure that we still had a family to pass on. So <clears throat> as we go through it, we'll notice that as the industrialization happens around the 1900s, and as the Western European countries develop at first, they're getting richer, the children per women is dropping, as we are also having an, a decreased child mortality. Now... Let's just look here, and let's just look what happens up until the 1940s first. There, and I'm going to stop it for a second. So, in the developed world, or you've known where the industrialization happened first, in Europe and in America, you can see the Americas down here, we have really developed, we're having fewer children, and we're also, yeah, and we're having fewer children, and the child mortality is also dropping which is good, that's really good news. Now what I want to show you here is look, there is a very important latency effect. The rest of the world is also going to develop. But all of the other dots, if you look at the blue dots, at the green dots, and at the South Asia dots, look at them. They're only moving to the left. Do you see? They're still only moving to the left. Now what does that do? If you only move to the left, you just have fewer and fewer, you have more, you still have a lot of children, but all of those children are surviving, and that's really what's caused the overpopulation of the world that we have today. Now, I'm going to finish off this point just by saying that in the last 40 years, you see a different tendency. You see that all of those are dropping. You're seeing good news here. In 2015, you can see that all of those dots are dropping. So I find that really interesting, and I find it really interesting to know that what, what Hans just said before, we are getting fewer and fewer children. And today, as of today, we don't have more children anymore. We have two on average in the world. And this figure really shows it. Now, I'm just going to show you one quick last consideration here, which has to do with phones. I'm just going to play through it fast. You can see in the beginning of the 1990s, we didn't have any phones. And then you can see we get richer, we pass ahead in time. And now, in those countries, Hong Kong, Saudi Arabia, we have two phones per person, so people have a phone in each hand. Okay, now here is when I'm returning to my presentation. Just a second. I just have to turn that off. Because this thing about phones leads me on to one interesting point. Let's just go to the next slide here. This is my Kenyan friend, and he's one of the people who is actually smarter than me, and who is really sitting in the bus every day for four days and looking on his phone, and he's reading Wikipedia all the time. You saw all of those phones it's increasing all over the world, and that is just my point, okay? You cannot understand, you cannot use the media if you want to understand the world. There's a lot of decisions today in international development, and I do a different talk about this, that are not being made uh, based on fact in the developing world. We are using really advanced methods in our part of the world, but not in the developing world. So one really interesting statistic is if you go on refugees.dk, if you look at the media picture about the whole refugee crisis and at the actual facts, then you'll also see a huge difference. Okay, now... Nepal also needs engineers. Now I'm, again, moving away from my World Health scope here. I just really wanted to share this because this is a library talk. I can talk about some other things too. Um, and these are some faces in Nepal. I wanted to show you because I just came home two days ago. Now, Nepal is a beautiful country. And what you see here is actually the place where the earthquake happened. It's mountains, right? It's beautiful. You're standing in the north. You're looking south. The mist is there. But if you zoom in on it, this is how it looked where my friends worked. Just after the earthquake, we sent a bunch of foreign aid out, and this is how Nepal looked at that time. 
so not happy times. This is in the epicenter of the earthquake. Now, Nepal is a really, really interesting country because as this has ended, the, the earthquake happened, they moved straight into a major political crisis. And there's been political crisis and insurgency there going on for years. In 2001, they've thrown, the, thrown to the, sorry, the heir to the throne in Nepal, killed the entire royal family. Now, the royal family in Nepal is not just the royal family. It's actually there, the, the king is blessed by the living goddess when he, and during the coronation. And actually, he is like a god. So it was the killing of a god. Um, the great irony was that he actually shot himself at the end of it, the heir to the throne, and had killed his parents first, and he shot himself. And he was coronated king while he was in coma because he survived his own shooting. So for two days, he was king of Nepal in a coma before he died. Now, I just want to say that since then, Nepal has actually, even up until today, been in a crisis. Now they have a constitutional crisis. There are some people um, who are not, they call the Madesi people. They're not satisfied with the current constitution. And this makes life very, very hard in Nepal. This is the, how it looks on the streets in the morning, 5 a.m., people working hard. Why are they working hard? They need firewood. They need firewood because the sanctions from India, the current sanctions, are blocking oil. So trucks everywhere are stranded like this. Oil is not coming into the country. And like this, buses are standing along the roads in huge lines everywhere, kilometers long and can't go anywhere. It's really difficult. You can only get it on the black market. So people have to suck it out of cans with a tube with their mouths and lead that tube into the engine. And that's how the, the petrol is flowing. And you can't get any petrol at the oil stations. Over here, you see how they're getting firewood into Kathmandu, the capital city, because they can only cook with that. And this is how they're cooking the firewood there on the right side or the left side of the image at the best hospital in the country they have to cook like this because there's also no gas. So that is the environment engineering world health is working in. And these are our hospitals that are the region of interest. So we are inside of Kathmandu here, Bhaktapur District Hospital, Hetaura District Hospital, Bharatpur District Hospital, Gorkha District Hospital up there. Right up there by the star is the epicenter of the earthquake. And over here are our most rural destinations, the Mission Hospital in Nokoldonga and the hospital, the district hospital in Paplu. On the way to get to the Mission Hospital at Paplu, the road looks like this. That's the jeep we're using to get there, and right up there is Mount Everest. And there you see how the hospital looks on the right side. So these are the environments Engineering World Health is working in. It's very hard. There's a lot of hardship, and it's really, really cold. This is a surgical room. The most common procedure is cesarean section. That's what they do a lot over there. Cesarean sections, let's say, are the single one most life-saving surgery that exists. And they do it a lot in Nepal. Very basic procedure room. Here you see how our engineers are working. I just came home, like I said, we had 14 engineers there. This is an infant resuscitation unit. They're working on it in the field. And here is my friend Robert Lathrop, one of our engineers who is working on an electrosurgery unit, explaining these people how they can change it and fix it if something goes wrong again. And Robert Lathrop is actually the guy who developed the successor for this machine. So it was really a great experience to have an engineer like him to work in the field on a machine that he really knew. So Nepal also needs engineers. And we've entered a memorandum of understanding with the DTU, Department for Electrical Engineering. And we're giving a course this summer, a three-week course. By the way, here is the memorandum of understanding signed. And we have two programs that we're running. We have a winter program. That's the one that just ended. That's the one that's in January. I'm running it, and I am having about 15 engineers with me. And then there's the summer one, where we're giving the three-week course to students who can then come with us and work in these hospitals that I just showed you. So that is really the relevance of all of this to our students at DTU. Here is the website where people can go and apply, and they can read more about the program. It looks like that. You can scroll through it. And down there somewhere, you can send your application to us. Scroll down on that one. This is just to show to those who are interested. Now, I'm going to finish off now because I'm over time, as I always am. I'm sorry about that. Um, 
I just want to show a few images from what we also do because really when you're doing work in developing countries at the end of the day it's always about the people so we bring some things for instance we bring some Lego and we play with the people this was when we were in Tanzania in Africa we donated this from Lego um, and we also donated some to this doctor, Maria Kadecker, the only neuro neurologist in all of Tanzania. She was using it in the rehabilitation. Here we're doing the same thing in Nepal. And here you can see how we're actually fixing equipment together with them, with the little girls, and doing that type of work as well. So I want to finish off here just to show you all that we are really also engaged in the community and we're doing a lot of different projects right over there. That's all for me. Thank you.